said amen. amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Praise God. Continue to pray. I've got a nerve pinch somewhere in my back of my back and my shoulder. I went today to uh, there's a little Asian lady in town that works on that. I want you to know I was crying uncle before she got through. And I'm actually sore now than I was this morning, but uh, please help me pray that whatever that is will turn loose and, and get back where it's supposed to be. It's good to see each of you here tonight, and I mean that from the very depths of my heart. If you have your Bibles, turn with us to the book of Proverbs 22. The Lord just keeps daily with me on this. Proverbs 22, we begin reading the verse 28 and 29. Yes, ma'am, they can go right on in the back. I'm sorry. I am. I'm for Proverbs 22, verses 28 and 29. I was talking to a, a minister, and while it's on my mind, let's not forget it. Brother uh, Blanchard will be preaching for us Sunday. So please make every attempt to be here. Brother Wayne Blanchard from Road Ridge will be preaching for us Sunday. So and service will start at 10 o'clock. Everybody say 10 o'clock. I'm going to pray from 9.30 to 10. Say that. We're all going to be here for 9.30, so just come at 9.30. We're going to pray at 10. And we're going to keep everyone out front. Proverbs 22, verses 28 and 29. A very, very familiar passage of Scripture. A very pertinent passage of Scripture. Let's read it together. Remove out the ancient landmark. It doesn't say plural marks. But it's the landmark. What is a landmark? It's a point of identification. I, I know there's a lot of those old Boudreaux, Timido jokes, and you know, he said you go down and you get you see the black and white Osteen cow and you turn left right there. I know that, but a landmark. Let me know this old big oak tree up here, Mr. Al. Mr. Al. Yeah. Yeah. They spent a lot of money moving it there. I spoke to someone the other day. I said, well, it really looks like it's taken. You know, I said, managers need some, some upkeep around it. And I said, there ought to be a real pretty flowery place out there. And he said, you volunteer to do it. I said, well, if I have to, I wouldn't mind doing it. I said, that old tree was around when, way before the turn of the century. I said, it's seen a lot of stuff. I said, it's kind of a landmark. I use it as a landmark. When I'm coming down the highway, when I see Mr. Al, I know I'm getting off. What's another landmark in, in just here in Highbury Parish? Shadows on the text. That's a landmark. A lot of history right there. Our courthouse is a landmark. And here, Solomon said, remove not the ancient landmark which thy fathers have set. Seest thou a man diligent in his business? He shall stand before kings. He shall not stand before mean men. Then turning to the 23rd chapter of Proverbs, verses 22 verse, through verse 26, Hearken unto thy father, Proverbs 23, chapter 23. 
Yeah, we can go to Proverbs chapter 23 for the herald. There you go. And go back to verse 22. That begat thee. And despise thy mother. When she, 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 she is old. By the truth. Yes. 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 Also wisdom and instruction. Yes. And understanding. Yes. Verse 24 says, The father of the righteous shall greatly rejoice. Yes. And he that begat a wise child yes. shall have joy yes. of him. Thy father and thy mother shall be glad, and she that bear thee shall rejoice. Yes. My son, give me thy heart, and let thy eyes observe my ways. Now turning to Timothy chapter 4. I don't know if he has any of those from the Herald, but Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. After we read this one, you should have them on your phone, the rest of them. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. First Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. You can just get that one up there, the rest of you can work on. All right. Here, Timothy says, the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith. Why? Giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. You mean the devil has a doctrine? Yes, he does. Yes, he does. And they give heed to seducing spirits and doctrine of doctrines. Of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats which God has created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. Look at your neighbor and say, I know the truth. I do know the truth. It's not a debatable thing. It's not up to debate. I saw the state police and had a man I know pulled over today. And after I passed, I texted him and I said, just tell him who you are. And he texted me back later and he said, that don't work. Wow. The law is the law. We're not able to break it. We're not above it. We can't get around it. We have to be obedient to it. I want to talk to us tonight about staying the course. You can be seated. I know, I don't know if they're true. Maybe some of you that follow the Olympics. Is the Olympics over? I don't know. I knew they were having the Olympics. I had saw it in the paper the other day, but I didn't know if it was finished or not. But in order to be in the Olympics, they have to train. Yes, sir. Millions of dollars are spent on that to prepare athletes to be qualified to be in the Olympics. And when they become a member of the Olympic team, they don't get up one morning and decide, well, I'm not going to go practice. That's the truth. Once you get into that, you have to stay the course. I thought about the scripture where it says the race is not to the what? Swiftness. It's not to the strongest, but it's to what? The one that endures. He that endures to the end. We have got to stay the course. You don't get the Holy Ghost on Sunday night and go back and do your own thing on Monday. Once you get in and become a part of the church, it has to become part of our lifestyle. 
Anybody ever tried changing gaining habits? Isn't that a barrel of bones? Yeah. It's bone. Oh my Lord. No, it's not. No, it's not. Any of you ever chastise yourself? Yeah. And you know you can't have that. I'm standing there and the lady at Walmart, she thought I was mad because of the way they had it laid out. And I'm standing there waiting with my buddy and I, I said, just quit looking at that. You know you can't have that. Just get on back over there and hang on to your buggy. And she said, is there something wrong, sir? I said, yeah. I said, I wish you didn't have that right here. Y'all killing me. <laughs> Y'all killing me. You know, I said, your alley is a candy section. And it ought to be somewhere. She said, but this is the strategy of wholesale and retail. She said, I know Sister Patsy used to work at Walmart. That, that's their strategy. Put the all that attempted stuff right there because they know you got to stand in line. And they know that most people have kids. Oh, sweet Brother Zeke, those kids, they want that. I listened to a daddy telling a little boy, he was two buggies up, he said, get over here and get back in the buggy. But daddy, I just want to look. He said, you don't just look. You look and then you touch it and the next thing you know, you got it in my buggy. Get back over here. I told her, I said, that, that's terrible. The, the dad has to chastise. I said, I'm here. I said, it wasn't that I was against what you got. I said, I just can't have it. She said, oh, I'm so sorry you're not bad because you know I'm fat. <laughs> and she's been working there a while. Her name is Miss Mary, elderly lady. And she said, Miss Burgess, she said, you've lost some weight. I said, I have. I said, I've lost almost 50 pounds. But I said, I put 10 on just standing here looking at this. <laughs> I picked up one of those, I don't know what they call them. They're covered with peanuts. Hey, I picked one of them. I said, I can eat about 10 of those right now. I know it. And I said, I'm standing here chastising myself, reminding myself that I can't have it. But the urge is still there. And I thought about that today. I said, the alcohol. The person that's trying to give us cigarettes. The person that's trying to get a hold themselves all the drugs. That must be how they feel when they see somebody smoking. Now, Brother Brent, he, he's a blessed one. He said he, he gave it up and, and it don't bother you, does That's God. Nothing but. I'm going to tell you, part of my, on my fast day, I pray, God, take away this craving. Because it's, it's there and and, and if you give in one time, you're sunk. I was praying early this morning. My, my arm was bothering me, and I was praying and asking God to heal my arm. And I said, God, take away that desire for sweets. Yeah. I'll be honest with you, that's a weakness of mine. Amen. I like sweets. And sugar is not good for me. Can okay, you get rid of it, George? Ask God to give you. Well, they even ask the doctor about giving me something for my metabolism to help me lose the weight. Right. Yeah, I, I, I look at people like Brother Zeno, he just eats what he wants. Yeah. <laughs> don't much better. He don't gain. Come out from among them 
I said, find somebody that believes what you believe, that is holiness or heaven. Find you somebody that believes what you believe, that is, is repentance, baptism in Jesus' name, and filling of the Holy Ghost. That's it. Right. Because we're living in a world where there are voices that are speaking in the people's ears, even saints of God. He really is. This moment in history, I, I'm a big history buff. I always love history. But this moment in history demands that we remain committed yes. to certain concepts. That's a fact. Two of them that have always been the very thrust of the church. Okay. But the early and presently is the desire for doctrinal preservation. Wow. Paul said their time would come when they would not endure sound doctrine. They would not endure holiness. They would not endure not spending like time. Brother Raymond Woodward sent me a text this morning. And he said, God never answers the prayers. Ah, that we don't pray. That we never pray. He said, just remember that, Brother Perkins. Yes. God never answers the prayers that we don't pray. He said, out of the mouth of babes and sucklings comes perfected praise. Yes. If we can pray it, God can fulfill it. Yes. We can yes. think about, oh, I want my children saved, but until we verbally Speak that out to God and say, Lord, you see Vicky, you see the world, you see Tony, you see Twyla, you see her religion, you see Monica, until we call their names out. God prophesies. We have to get it out. Will the church either locally, nationally, or internationally will embrace the doctrine of the early church? It will grow. Yes, it will. Mm -hmm. When we embrace, what does the word embrace mean? So, to hold close. Pull it in close to us. Pull it in and begin to apply it to our lives. When we embrace the doctrine of the early church, and their mode of evangelism, the church will grow. Hallelujah. But we've got to embrace it. Yes, sir. I can't just say, I know the Pentecostals of Lydia. That's a true I've got to fact. say, I am the Pentecostals. Yes, I am. I believe the doctrine. I believe the word of God. He said, I never I believe that with all of my heart. Amen. But we have to teach the doctrine of the early church. Therefore, there is a task. There is a task that presents itself to our generation, and that is to defend the great tenets of the apostolic Amen. doctrine Amen. and heritage. Some have looked on the word defend and felt that this was a inequitable and, and menial job of the church. Preach it. But I want you to know when we begin to really get a hold of God yes. and uh, we begin to really truly I want you to know when I dress holy I'm defending the doctrine. That's right. I am defending. When I talk holy I am defending the doctrine yeah. of God's church. I protect. He told Peter upon this rock I will build my church. And the very gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. Amen. We have to defend that doctrine. Yes, sir. Holiness, righteousness, yes. living holy, talking holy, yes, being yes. holy. It has to become a part of our lifestyle. Amen. That's right. Some Sundays, and those that's going to eat out, they said, Where y'all want to go? I said, It's got to happen. Me, it's grill. I don't want no fried food. I don't want nothing with rice. I don't want nothing with potatoes. Some of the men I retired with, I was out in y'all's area the other day on Kitty Boutro's house. He, he called me and 
He said, I want you to come. He said, I want you to pray over our meal. He said, we're having a little get-together with people, some of the men that's retired. And, and so I wasn't real sure where he was at. I turned and went down y'all's road, and then I turned, instead of going to y'all's house, I turned left, went back in there by Creighton Heights, and, and I found his house. I knew what it looked like once I got there. And he said, man, I got some good food cooked today. And Kenny Boutreau's a good cook. Real good. And I get in there and he said, go over and lift him lids on that pot look in there. He has smothered rat. Oh, oh. <laughs> oh, Jesus. I know he did. It kind of looked like chihuahua dogs. Today. <laughs> <laughs> and I looked at him and I said, what is this? Fresh what did you call this? Uh-huh. He said, over here I got rice. I got potato salad. Everything I could eat. All the fat. Oh, come on, brother. Just one day it ain't going to kill you. I counted me out four grains of white rice. Four grains. Just four grains. I got a little bit of that gravy. Brother Zeno, it was everything I could do to get that to go down. Come on. Because it was rapid. <laughs> but I stood firm and he said, Well, I know you can have this. He had homemade bread pudding with raw sauce. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. I said, Kim, Man, you're killing me. He said, What about a big cold? I said, No, I'll take a bottle of water. But you know what? It's become my lifestyle. Yeah. I've been doing it almost a year now. I don't try to be offensive with it. But if I'm going to go eat, i got to go where I can have something to eat. That's right. And it's my lifestyle. That's right. And living for God has to become a part of my lifestyle. It really does. I don't dress the way I dress because of somebody else. I dress because of the way God says I'm supposed to dress for I don't do it to please anybody else but God. Him. And I, when we begin to live for God as saints of God, we've got to do it because it makes God happy. It pleases right. Him. Amen. It's big and brother Paul Bellamy, you fix him a plate, he's a pastor, three people can eat off of my plate. She piles it up there. <laughs> Sister Annabelle. She was trying to keep up with Brother Ron. I said, you'll never lose weight, baby, trying to eat like him. <laughs> I said, just get you a little bit. Because she was wanting me to try to help her. She said, I really won't lose. And yeah, I said, well, you've got to cut out on your proportions. And get off of that rice. And that's a main staple for a Filipino. They've got to have that rice. They eat rice every day. Yeah. When she got to the Philippines, they said, oh, boy, you look like an American. Yeah, they told her, you're an American. <laughs> American side. Bless her heart. <laughs> Brother Don. And add on to what you said about she enjoys it because it's your lifestyle. But what you got here now, I mean, it's got to be the Holy Ghost. And I used to love to bend the elbow. But when I quit drinking, I was over by the guy. He was still drinking. I have a, he said, come on, man, get I said, I don't drink. And we were together and drink every day. God took it away. God takes it away. And if you have a problem in an area, just pray, Lord, deliver me from that. I don't want my desires of my flesh. Override my spirit. I, I had a chance to talk with Brother Woodward a couple years ago, two or three hours. I, I just sat and listened to him, and, and he was telling me about Holy Ghost filled people, baptized in Jesus' name, filled with the Holy Ghost that are carnal. He said, I teach they're carnal Christians. He said, and if they don't change as God, because it's a journey. As God begins to show you this is wrong, then we're supposed to, okay, I'll get rid of it. That's right. As God shows you, you get rid of it. 
I don't believe anybody is born with the Holy Ghost, filled with the Holy Ghost, and instantly has all knowledge of what's right and wrong. It's totally contrary to the Word of God. Paul's teachings, he teaches them it's a journey you on. In Romans chapter 7, he said, the things that you do that you don't want to do. And he said, the things that I don't want to do, that's what I do. He said, because of indwelling sin. The Lord forgives us of our sin. He forgives us of our sins or we wouldn't get the Holy Ghost. And Brother Wood said, but after we are forgiven of our sins and God fills us with the Holy Ghost, then we have to learn. Paul said, I die daily. Because you're going to slip up and mess up. Because you're still in sinful flesh. The Holy Ghost is living inside a flesh that is weak. He said the flesh is spirit is willing, but the flesh is what? Weak. Is weak. So don't get too far from the old ancient landmarks. It's holiness or hell. That's God. He said, without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. Some have worked on the word of the and felt that it was uh, a mental manual or manual job of the church. But numerous commands in the epistles demand that we defend the truth yes, and deliver the truth in the same breath. Yes, sir. Uh, I've had people come in frustrated with me, people, friends of mine, because somebody would be talking about their experience with God and say, I'm on my way to heaven. And I can't stand there and support that. I'm telling us, well, the Word of God says now that you have to repent. Well, I did. You have to be baptized in His name. His name. And nine times out of ten, that old, I was baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. I said, well, that is not the formula for baptism. I said, Paul said there's one Lord, there's one faith, and there's one baptism. And I'm not telling you that, that our church is the only one that's got the truth. I know there's, there's this talk, but that is not true. We are a small nucleus of the body of Christ. Amen. We are. As long as we are living holy and righteous. I, I told a guy just what yesterday, the day before yesterday, it was Saturday. I told him, I said, you know, he said, well, I'm a Christian. I said, well, we, we have to understand that we're a Christian. What is a Christian? somebody that's Christ-like. I said, James had a church of over 20,000 in Jerusalem. And I said, his church was not called a Christian church. I said, they were not first called Christians unto Antioch. Because James's church, the Jewish church, thought it was only the Jews that could have this. And that spirit has got a hold of our world. Our religious world has got a hold of it. And some people feel like unless you're part of their church, you can't be a part of the church. That is not a Bible. No, it's not. Nowhere in the book. They were first called Christians at Antioch because they believed that the Gentiles could have it too. They became Christ. Like, what did Jesus do? The Bible says he went to the house of the sinner. That's right. God never intended for us to isolate us from a group of people, but we are to be isolated. That hedge that I talked about Sunday. The Bible, Paul said, we are sealed with the Holy Ghost until the day of redemption. That seal, I'm the only one that can break it. You're the only one that can break it. Well, how do we break it, Pastor? We break it when we sin and refuse to repent over it. Unrepented sin. History is littered with the carcasses of men and movements who throw away their doctrinal stances. Yes, sir. That's the truth. United Methodist Church, District Superintendent for the state of Louisiana, stood at the campground yes. on the platform and they, they let him speak a little bit uh, about who he was. He was the District Superintendent of the United Methodist and and he turned around because there was people shouting. There was people dancing in the Holy Ghost, talking in tongues. And 
He turned around and looked at Brother Teddy and said, at one time, we had this. We had it. At one time, the Methodists believed in the filling of the Holy Ghost. The Tim. Methodists believed in holiness, dress, and holiness teaching. And they said, we lost it. Because we compromised in an area. And when you open the gate, there's no shutting it back. Let's look into the scriptures, Brother Harold, if you will. Jude chapter 3. I mean, Jude 1, verses 3 and 4. The epistles demand that we defend the truth yes, sir. and deliver the all truth God. in the same breath. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith, for the faith. which was once delivered unto the saints. Verse 4. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. All right. He said you've got to contend. You've got to stand for this. You've got to stand for this. I met a man last Saturday at, at Lowe's and and he's a guy that owns Charlie's, used to own Charlie's restaurants. They had one in Franklin. I think they had one or two here in New Iberia. Uh, I, I think he had some in Lafayette. And he was telling me, he said, I used to go to this preacher's church. And he said, you know, Brother Perkins, I love that guy. And he said that he was my best friend. He wasn't only my pastor, he was my best friend. And he said he got in, he had teenage children that was wanting to go to college. And he said he just couldn't do it preaching. So he quit preaching and he went offshore as a consultant. Now he's making tons of money. He said, but it made me feel like the church must not have been as important to him oh God. as he made it seem. We have to live this every day. I don't want somebody to think I'm one thing and be something else. Another another. What is that? It's a two-faced. It's a hypocrite. The Bible calls it a hypocrite. If I profess to be one thing in church and I profess to be something else out of the, the, the street, Paul said, I'm a hypocrite. The Indian says you speak with a forky tongue. We have to contend for this every day of our lives. Sister Lucretia, when I see you, I, I gotta be the same as I am here in church. As you see me. You have to be the same as you are in church. Amen. We have to be the same. God. We have to contend Please. for the faith. If you will, put 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Jude said we have to contend for the faith. Yes. 2 Peter 2, verses 1 and 2. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and our Lord Jesus, Jesus Christ. Or Jesus our Lord. Verse 2. According as the divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. And godliness. What is godliness? Holiness. Being Christ-like. Through the knowledge of Him that called us to glory and virtue. If you will now, Brother Harold, put uh, Titus 1 and 18 up there. We're just going to read a few of these. I want you to see. Here he says we're supposed to live. They profess that they know God. Just you don't have to call them names, but do you know somebody that's always professing they know God, but in their actions they do? Yeah. They really don't know nothing about it. You mean Titus 1 and 16? 1 and 18. 1 and 18. There is no 18. 16? It's 16, yes, sir. I didn't have my glasses on. The words are small. They profess that 
they know, that they know God, but in words, they, they know God. Hello. Yes. Hello. Yes. Hello. Yeah, but that stuff makes me look so cute for the purpose. I know the church don't like it. No, God don't like it. Right. Good God. We blame too much on the church. And we need to be careful with that because the church is the body of Christ. It's not this building. It's not the denomination. If I talk evil of my brother or my sister, that's just like me. Standing here the whole time slapping my face. I've hurt part of my body right. when I hurt you. Yes. Amen. If I profess to know God, but in works, mm -hmm. we're not living by works. I don't know what you call it. Paul said, show me your faith without your works, and I'll show you my faith by, by my works. That's right. what Paul said. Works are very important. Works won't save you. But works is a part of me being a part of the body of Christ. It's very, very important we understand this. We have to defend it. He says denying him being what? Abominable. And disobedient. And to every good work a reprobate. Because I profess to be something and I don't live it. I'll live another. Young man in town the other day, and I don't know, it's just me and I do it. I ain't said everybody has to do it, but young man, he, he just got back overseas. He was in his Marine uniform. He was sitting at a table by himself. And I just do this. It, it's, Call it a patriotic or whatever you want. Uh, I walked over and said, first, where are you going? I said, I need to go speak to him. I walked up and I said, just want to tell you I appreciate your service, buddy. He said, thank you, sir. It's just my duty. His ticket lay there and I grabbed it. He said, no, sir, no, sir. I said, yeah, I said, I'm going to do this. He said, somebody else already did it. <laughs> I want you to pay twice for it. I said, well, then it don't matter if you got it or not. I said, I'll just keep it in my pocket. <laughs> but even though he's on furlough, he got to yeah. come back to the States and he got to go he's home and see mom home. and dad, he's still in the uniform. Yeah. Because he's a Marine. He's part of the court. He didn't run home and take it off and said, oh, I'm tired of that. So I went back over and took his ticket and I said, look, just throw it in the trash. I said, no. said somebody's already got it. I said, how do you like the Marine Corps? He said, it's an honor to serve, sir. He said, I am honored to be called Marine. I said, well, I noticed you. You said you were off and he said, oh, sir, he said, as long as I'm active in the service, I wear my uniform. Because I am proud to be called a Marine. We live in a society today where we say we've got dress clothes, or church clothes, and we've got work clothes. And we all do. I wear a suit to church because my mom instilled that in just as a young, young preacher, an elder in the church, he was a, or I'm sorry, was an icon of the holiness movement. Elder Senior George Glass. Yes, sir. 19 years old, I was in a young minister's class at, at the Cap Brown. He was teaching us about how to act and he said, don't be so stinking lazy. You don't get up and iron your shirt before you go out. <laughs> he said, if you young men are fortunate enough to get a wife that irons, make sure she keeps your shirts ironed. He said, if you're going to be a preacher, walk like a preacher. Talk like a preacher. 
He said, I better not walk around this campground and catch you over there telling all color jokes. He said, just remember, Papa Glass is watching. I used to walk around the cat right now. I was always looking at him. He come up to me and said, Son, don't worry about me. Worry about God. He said, God sees you when you're at home. He sees you when you're out. He said, If you're going to be a preacher, act like it. Yes, sir. We have to defend one more scripture, 1 John 2, verse 22. We've got to defend this thing. 1 John 2, verse 22. Let's read. Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Here, and I don't know how many know that, but in the original text, there was no conjunctions and. King James installed the ands and the commas. If you go back and read the original Isaiah scrolls, and there was no commas, there was no chapters. It just, it all just was wrote out. So when King James had the Bible translated, he put the and. So here he that denied the Father, the Son, if you just drop the and. It makes a lot more sense. Because Jesus said, I and the Father are one. He said, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I know there's a movement that started back in 325 A.D. with Constantine of the Trinity. But if you go back and study, you can go to any library. If you can find an old 1957 issue of the Britannica Encyclopedia, you will find the Roman Catholic Church baptized in Jesus' name up until Constantine changed that at the Council of Nicaea. It's always forever changing. I had a lady call me and she was mad because she said, why do they keep changing the word? I said, it's not the word they're changing, they're just changing the rules. Just as Nehemiah worked with a sword in one hand and a trial in the other when he was rebuilding the wall, Samuel said, Come down! He said, I got too great a work to do. I can't come down. I can't debate this. I'm not going to argue with him. I got a sword in my right hand and I got my brick trial in the other. And I'm going to keep working to get the work of God done. You and I are going to have to defend the doctrine of God's Word. As I said, history is littered with the carcasses of men and movements who render away their doctrinal stances. There's a little intact in what remains of their efforts. Therefore, doctrinal purity must have a high priority yes, sir. in our times. 1 Corinthians 13 and 5, if you'll turn there real quickly. 1 Corinthians 13 and 5. Does not behave itself unseemly. Seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil. Do not behave itself. He's talking about what? Love. The love of God does not behave itself unseen. Doesn't seek her. Not always seeking what they want, but is seeking the will of God. This sign was given to me a few years ago. I keep it up here. It is said that says no compromise. No compromise. There is no place in the Word of God where we can compromise to make the world happy. Isaiah 1 and 18. 1 Peter 3 and 15. We're just going to read these two scriptures quickly. I want you to see it in the Word of God. Doctrinal purity must have a high priority in our lives. Isaiah 1 and 18. Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. You can't stay where you're at. Brother Tim, 
What's his name? Timothy Freeman. Timothy Freeman. He sings a song. He didn't leave me the way that he, the way that he found me. To die in my sins. When God finds us and he looks inside of us and he sees something he can use and every person has something that will benefit God's kingdom. Every one of us are uniquely made. God put something unique inside of us. And he said, amen, in his word there, that we need to help people understand. Though your sins though there are written and they be in scarlet, he said, God can wash them white as snow. We can't tell them you can stay where you had, but God wants to bring you up out of the bulk of the mile. This is particularly an important issue in the light of well-documented and defined postmodern society where truth is extremely relative yes. and no longer is discovered in the colors of black and white but rather a very opaque gray. I had somebody ask him, that's a gray area. I said, there are no gray areas in God. He said, it's either yay or nay. There is no, well, maybe it could be this way, or maybe it is. no neutral. This Word of God gives us explicit instructions of what God will take and what He'll cast aside. That's the God's and we have to depend on this Word. We have to get to a place where we understand this Word. And all of that is part of our doctrinal heritage. The words leap from the prophet Hosea's mouth in Hosea 4 and 6 when he said, My people are destroyed from a lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee, that thou shalt be no priest to me. You can't be in my kingdom. Seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forget thy children. It not only affects me, but it's going to affect my children. And it's going to affect our grandchildren. Right. There is no place for compromising. No. There is no place where we can back down. We've got to know the Word of God. He said, search the Scriptures, for in them, yeah. in the Scriptures, yeah. in God's Word, we then, we have eternal life. Now as then, ignorance of the Word of God is a major cause of spiritual shipwreck. My God. Instruction in righteousness is the only means of ensuring safety and security for my descendants. That's the God's honest truth. My uncle W.M. King. Everybody knew him as Buddy. Uncle Buddy told me, he said, some of my people came and, and later, after I moved into this area, where they bear told me the same thing. He said, I had couples come to me and said, if you would just let down on that standard, the standard, if you would just let down and that back standard. off some and not be so strict with the world, we could fill this place up. We could pack it. Brother Amer, Sister Amer, sitting there, if I'm wrong, correct me. He said, if I do that, I'll have a church full of people that are lost. What good would it do? What good would it do? A lack of knowledge can and will destroy the purpose of an apostolic church. What is the purpose of his church? Win people to the kingdom of God. So that when they die, they can go to heaven. The greatest example for any new convert is people sitting on the pews. It should be. That's first and foremost. When I first got into the church, I said, well, what do I have to do? And my pastor said, you see Brother Swain back there? I said, yes, sir. Take a good look at Just, just. Copy his life. His brother Swain, he didn't waver. He lived 
He was on fire with God. Now he didn't tell me, go over there and see Brother Pee Wee. Uh. Brother Pee Wee was loose as Hershey's chocolate cake in that middle. <laughs> One Sunday he was amen and the pastor bring something he didn't like and sat there and just clam up. But Brother Swain, he was there preaching hard, Pastor. Preaching harder to him. Hotter. Please, Pastor, my man is going to die lost if you don't preach it hard. So he said, you just kind of follow Brother Swain as a new baby. So I started mimicking what he did. If Brother Swain got up and shouted, I got up and shouted. I didn't know why he was shouting, but he's doing it. That's what I need to do. Then as I grow older, he told me, don't follow no man, follow God. You follow God. You try to please God. He said, if you'll please God, you'll be all right with me. We have to defend this. We defend it by living at all costs. We defend it by living it. Despite the fact that technology is blossoming, there must be the firm foundation of Scripture yes, sir. to settle and resolve the mind and heart of the saints of God. Oh, firm there is a God of this world who relentlessly pursues and blinds the minds of this present world. That's a fact. Know that during the temptation of the Lord, he resorted to the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy, chapter 8, verse 3 from the Herald. Deuteronomy 8, 3, listen to it. And he humbled thee, and suffered thee to hunger, and fed thee with manna which thou knewest not, neither did thy fathers know. That he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread only, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. God is constantly reminding us that we don't live by bread alone, but we live by every word. Word. John 1 and 1 says what? In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. We have to live by every word of God. I had a young man call me not long ago and he says, Brother Perkins, I wish I could hear from God. I said, do you read your Bible? Yes, sir, every morning. I said, you hear from God every time you open God's word. He speaks. God is speaking to you. But he said in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He's telling you, I've been here since it started, and my Word is still here with you. And when you read my Word, you're talking to me, and I am talking to you. Amen. He's talking back. During the temptation, let's look at Deuteronomy 6 and 16. In the beginning, Deuteronomy 6. There you go. You shall not tempt the Lord your God, and as you, you tempted him, him and Basel. And Basel. God is telling us, don't tempt me. Do not tempt me. And God can tempt no one. God tempts no man. This implies that there was a wealth of knowledge about the law. And the mind of Christ. Paul warned Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, and I'm closing. The time will come, and I quoted it a while ago. Let's read it. Traitors, petty, high minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. It's a dangerous thing to just have a form of God. It looks like God. And then deny the power thereof. Men would depart from the faith. Paul warned Timothy. Titus, in a singular situation, was urged to speak the things which become sound doctrine. Titus 2 and 11. Let's stand. This is 
the only effective antidote to defection from the faith and the destruction of your soul is to stay in the Word and then live it. James again said, if a man hears the Word and don't do it, then he's deceiving himself. Paul also induced that because these errors would remain prevalent with the term of the Lord, there must be a continued and expressive warning from the pulpits of those who will fill the role of a minister of the gospel. We have to defend the faith. Well, be honest with you. If you got something that that you feel that you wear that's not holy, I just go get rid of it. Then the temptation is gone. Amen. If you if you got something in your home, I told a young I told a young couple, I said, you need to get rid of that computer you got. Because her husband was looking at things on there that he shouldn't have been looking at. And he said, I'm gonna get rid of that preacher. I was just I was giving them some pastoral counseling and so I'm gonna get rid of it. And he never did. And they came for their next session. And he walked in and his lip was dragging. And I said, what's the matter? He said, she busted my computer. I said, she did what? She shattered it. He said, Pastor, I, I got home and that thing was in the driveway in a million pieces. I said, well, God helped her to give you a little assistance since she was tested to get rid of it. You got something in your life that, that gives you problems. Just get rid of it. Defend the doctrine of the Lord. God bless you for being here. I heard some young people saying, Boy.